here with NERBDA, with John DePietro and our special guest tonight, Chuck Woodbury. And we've just experienced about 20 minutes of technical difficulties. I wasn't sure we were actually going to be able to put this show on tonight, but we are here and we're delighted to have Chuck with us. So I think I think we don't have a whole lot to talk about this week. I'm pretty sure there's a Hemlock Hill Spring Sale this weekend. Haven't seen too many others. Um, I do have one announcement that we haven't done yet. We finally got permission to say so tonight, but Vermont Country Campers is expanding and they are moving into just around the Chichester, New Hampshire area. It's going to be called New Hampshire Country Campers. They are open for service now. I just got the information about a half hour ago. We'll be posting up on the Nerve to website, but they will have a second location opening soon. They are open right now for service, and they will be opening up as they start to move the stock in there on that. Uh, as I said, our special guest tonight is Chuck Woodbury from RV Travel. And I'm sure if I can do three windows here and put that over there and hide Chuck's information, then you got all three of us. And Mr. DePietro is on vacation. Where are you this week, Mr. DePietro? I am RVing, Bob. And uh, you know what? I'm so excited because it's the first time I've had a chance to uh, get in this unit since last, last October. And Chuck's so lucky he gets to RV virtually all year. He gets to follow the sun. But uh, we're working off a school calendar, and right now we are in the metropolis of Paducah, Kentucky. And as soon as we're done this broadcast, I'm having dinner with the Duke of Paducah. <laughs> the Duke. And Chuck, a uh, longtime RVer, longtime writer, probably one of the most respected writers in our industry. We, I've certainly been following here for a long time. Where are you tonight? And uh, tell them a little bit about yourself and RV travel. Well, I'm in um, I'm in Wichita Falls, Kansas, coming up north from a few months down south around Kerrville. And uh, RV travel, for those that don't know, has been around. We started a weekly newsletter 17 years ago, and uh, it's just uh, you know grown, grown, grown. We have uh, uh, about a couple hundred thousand different viewers a month. And uh, we put actually put out 25 newsletters uh, a week, uh, no, a month. Yeah, we have RV, RV Daily Tips, which runs one Monday through Thursday, and then RV Travel, the newsletter at rvtravel.com is every uh, Saturday. And it's just, you know, we have a lot of different writers, about a dozen writers that contribute. It's just almost like a magazine, a technical, lifestyle, whatever. No, time um, out. You're, you're selling yourself short. It's not like a magazine. It's like an encyclopedia because yeah. <laughs> every week, there's so many different topics that are covered. I think you sell yourself short if you refer to yourself only as a magazine uh, because it really is so much more. Yeah, well, mag magazine in a sense that there's a lot of different uh, topics covered. But, yeah, I, we try to just be uh, interpret what's going on out there um, with, you know, like I said, about a dozen different writers. And, and in a week's time, I don't know how many words we put out there how many pictures how many videos but we're always digging for information that's valuable and um, useful to our viewers um, and really that's that's kind of our mission and it has been for me for a long time mm. well i've been i've been putting you in my presentations for probably more than 10 years and i, I always tell the people it's one of the more important slides not because you're with us tonight but because the amount of information that you're able to consolidate in your newsletter every week. I literally, as soon as that comes in, I grab my cup of coffee and I sit down and I start reading, whether it's here in Hudson or if it's sitting up on my uh, my deck in Maine. Uh, we've got visitors already. Jerry Plant is back with us. Jerry's a regular. He, he with Mage's RV and does some RV service stuff. Uh, Michelle Fontaine from Two Gals and a Dog from Rolling On TV. She says, uh, well, let me, I'll let you answer her question. Can you see that, Chuck? How many people are involved? About, uh, um, well, I would say staff members who are, you know, kind of live and breathe it, about uh, maybe five or six of us, and then six regular contributors. You know, we have Mike Sokol, who's the National Authority on Electricity. Gary Bunzer contributes to us, uh, the RV doctor. We have a, a, an astronomer who talks about, you know, interprets the night sky for uh, our viewers who have the chance, you know, uh, often to look up. Um, Boondocking, um, RV tire safety, uh, Roger Marble, who's a retired Firestone executive. I mean, it just, uh, and then the pet vet, Deanna 
Uh, Tolliver, she's a retired veterinarian, just just sold her practice. Up she's doing our pet stuff. It goes on and on. Yeah. Yep. Uh, one of the things, and in, in Michelle says, Michelle says, true, we get your newsletter and there's so much in it. Well, I already said that. I, I beat you to that, Michelle. No, Bob, I said it. Bob, I said it. Well, I you said, said the copy to what Good. I said. Let's jump into some hot topics. Um, yeah. I, I know one of the things that bothers you, Chuck, and bothers all of us, is the lack of available campgrounds. You, you speak about it often in terms of the number of units that we sell, the number of people that are on the road, and you're on the road full-timing and you're in a much larger RV. So explain your transition, if you would, from your small uh, Winnebago view to your big motorhome and what you're finding when you're out there. Because you're out there full-time, so you're living and breathing it, much like Greg Gerber did for his three years on the road. Yeah. Well, you know, I started um, half my life ago. I started about my first motorhome when I was about 34. So I've seen huge change. You know, I mean, back then there were, what, half as many RVers as there are today, basically the same amount of campgrounds. And now you're putting a half a million RVs on the road every year. Um, in this campground I'm in now, which probably has 100 sites, 29 of the people here are uh, people that are working on a local pipeline. They're going to be here for six months or longer. And so uh, you got full-timers, baby boomers. There's just not enough places for everybody to go. You need, uh, you know, um, reservations in the really popular places a year ahead. Um, my daughter just tried to make a reservation in a camp, public campground near Seattle, anything, state parks, whatever. It, was, it took her forever to find a spot. It's, uh, you just can't put that many people out there and have no increase in campsites and then find people that want 50 amps. They want everything. They want Wi-Fi. They're not going to go out to the boonies. And if you got a residential refrigerator like all of them have now, but you know, you can't, it's very difficult to boondock. So you're forced into an RV park and they're very crowded and uh, it's a real problem. Hey, Chuck, you brought yeah. up, a, you brought up a very interesting point where you said 29 of the people that are in the park, um, they're not really campers. They're not RVers. They are people that happen to be living in an RV park, but they don't share any of the same, um, uh, not skills, that's not the right word, but, yeah. but any of the desires that you have. They're not there for a good time. They're there to, um, you know, sleep and eat and go back to work the next day. So that is really um, one third of the park that's being taken out of the recreational RVer inventory. And that certainly is a factor. And uh, as Jerry pointed out here, seasonals seem to be taking up a lot of real estate. Bob, maybe you want to mention that because one of the things that Bob is is uh, proficient in telling us about is Bob is in a seasonal park with no uh, overnighters. I hate to use the word transients, but overnighters. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a whole other um, circumstance, Bob. Yeah, uh, yeah we, it's classified as a campground, but it's all park model RVs, and it's like a second community. So it's not available to the other RVs. It's a great uh, thing from a real estate development standpoint. It's great that we have all park models in there, and that's up in Old Orchard Beach, but there's a lot of campgrounds around, and, and a lot of the campgrounds in that Old Orchard Beach area, actually, every, I think Jerry's right on the mark, uh, they have gone to seasonal campgrounds to kind of get a steady uh, cash flow at the beginning. So a percentage of their, their sites are always dedicated to seasonal. So those are never going to be turned over. So if they started out uh, years ago with 100 sites at a campground and every weekend they had 100 different guests in there, that was wonderful. And then they said, well, you know, if we put five seasonals in here, we'll have that money up front in the beginning. And a lot of those parks, a lot of parks, two, two issues. A lot of them have 25 to 35 uh, percent seasonals. And then the other is the ability for these parks now to put in cabins and park models that they rent out on a regular right. basis. So we're going the wrong direction. We're not building enough campgrounds. We don't have enough. And then the ones that we do have are finding that the revenue sources from cabins and uh, destination campers is pretty lucrative. So you've, you've lost half of them there. Yeah, you know. And, uh, hey, Chuck, uh, Chuck, in your situation where you're going across the country, could you just uh, discuss, after you talk about what you were just talking about before I interrupted yeah. you, could you just talk about the diversity in the quality of the um, um, campground facilities that you've seen in time? Because I, I think it's amazingly diverse. Yeah, it's, um, it's really nice places. That's 15%, 20%. Then there's 
50% that are decent and then there's 20% that are dumps and uh, you don't want to be in them. And when you start figuring all the RV parks in America, there's a lot of them. You just, they're, they're all, you know, they're, they're either they're weeds all over the place or dog poop or they're full-time residents who are on a budget who just are getting by and they got all their kids there and they're packing a family in. And it's just not a, it's not the kind of RV park that we like to think about. The, I'm, I'm convinced that there's, there needs to be a new terminology for RVs and that they got to be called LV for living vehicles. Um, yep. RV parks have become trailer parks. There no, there, nobody's right. camping. Exactly. Very few people. KOA tries to do everything. They put a fire pit, you know, 10 feet from your neighbor's RV and then you got to sit there and suck up smoke all night. Um, they're trying to pack in as many. They're trying to be kid friendly and they are, but, um, but for my crowd, which is older and, uh, you know, very avid full timers, um, when you've got a RV with a, re a residential refrigerator and heated floors and a washer dryer and dishwasher and built in vacuum cleaner, two bedrooms and two baths, don't tell me you're camping. You're not. That's not camping. And the RVA <laughs> has got to say, come on, this go where you want, when you want idea is dead. It's possible. No. I want to stay at Walmart, but you know, I've never seen an RVA ad where they're showing the wonders of camping at Walmart. They show you on a beautiful beach or forest. Yeah, good luck. Bar. So um, a lot of bar. people, um, not enough places to stay. It's uh, still wonderful, but it's more challenging. Yeah, and, and one, of, one of the things that we're seeing, uh, certainly in the Class B, um, we're seeing a lot of this in the Class B, they're going with lithium ion batteries that mm -hmm. are extending the uh, off camp off campground, you know, the, the boondocking, if you will. And that generation wants that. So I, I think on that lower end, the smaller Class Bs and Class Cs, we're going to see a lot more of them totally self-sufficient with the lithium-ion batteries and the solar panels and the inverters because th that group and that classification may not want to go to campgrounds. They want to go out hiking and fishing. They want to be sitting right by the stream. So so there is a changing dynamics that we're seeing at, uh, at that end of the scale. Uh, I would suggest to you, Bob, that 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 uh, having a residential refrigerator, they're mostly in fifth wheels, the big fifth wheels. Um, I know there's some totally electric Class Bs in a run electric, but if you're going to be out boondocking, why in the heck would you not have a refrigerator that'll run a propane rather than having to load up on solar panels and eat up so much of your power just to keep your food cold when you can have a propane one? It's not. That's not smart. And um, and uh, and you know what? They want Wi-Fi. They want everything. And uh, who knows how many people, our readers, maybe 6 7% of them, really go out there and boondock for extended periods. Yeah. Hey, Jerry, guys. Who, who, can, go ahead, Bob. I, I just want Jerry to maybe uh, uh, elaborate a little bit on his statement. I realize you're not on live TV here with us, Jerry, but you said it's a, a big problem now in Florida. Um we covered a lot of things since your last comment. So are you referring to the seasonals or the campgrounds with the rentals or just the fact that they're running yeah, out of campgrounds? talking about year-round people because I saw when he posted that. And I and I, I noticed when he posted that is when Chuck was talking about uh, people that are living year-round or not necessarily year-round but maybe seasonally. But they're not RVers. They're people that, that work and live down there. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, yeah. Hey, yeah, my reservations in your audience. Hey guys, one here's one thing that I want to uh, I want to discuss. Wait, wait. The third party there's a third party testimonial there. It says it says we're the uh, best ones in entertainment and educational information. Well, I'm, I'm not sure what you're comparing us to, but we're we're certainly better than fake news. But we're, we're not even going to try to open up that can of worms. No, no, no. Look at what Michelle says there. She just crossed the country twice, going out to Arizona to their winter home, and uh, have never been turned away. But we do it from October to April. We always get full hookups. But you're also, I think, going from Massachusetts to Arizona, you may have taken some routes that are not heavily traveled. I think, to Chuck's point, the uh, the major cities, and, and let me see if Jerry... Uh, Jerry 95 Lee. Corridor. Well, it's the only way my dear Jerry says it's the only way my, Jerry says the only way my dear wife will go with me. I'm losing you. Uh, with, with, with all the equipment, with all the equipment. 
Here's, here's one. Let's dump, let's dump this one back on Chuck because this is a hot topic. Uh, experience to get John down in Kentucky there. But uh, when right. you're going out there, Chuck, what are you finding in terms of Wi-Fi and how would you – how would you rate that on a scale of one to ten in terms of what you're finding when you travel? I know you were stationary there for the last couple of months. Yeah. Um, first of all, you dropped off a little bit there, Bob, but I got the question. Um, the Wi-Fi in RV parks is un- unreliable. It, uh, I hardly ever am able to rely on it. Once in a while, you get on early in the morning or at night, but it's not very good. We have a, you know, a uh, I can use my cell phone, and we have a, a Air Card MiFi card from Verizon, which. Um, usually with one of those three, we'll always get on. Um, but Wi-Fi in the parks has got a long ways to go. And, you know, some parks are in the middle of nowhere. They don't have much choice. They just don't have bandwidth to, available to them. So they're kind of stuck. They might be in a DSL line. And, you know, it's like bringing in the Wi-Fi on a half-inch hose and you got everybody in there that, you know, bringing the, all the water into the park in a half-inch hose and thinking everybody's going to you be able to take a shower at the same time. It doesn't work. So. so, Chuck, as an example of what you just said, I am in a campground right now, a relatively new campground, and I'm going to talk about a deficiency with it in just a minute. But um, uh, Bob and I got here an hour and a half early. We got we get, we hooked up an hour and a half early, and uh, I was on the campground Wi-Fi, which was useless. And yeah. luckily, we have my MiFi, which my wife brought along. I would have forgotten to bring it. Yeah. And we're on with that, um, you know, Verizon product. But you you would think that one of the main things that campgrounds would do, when all the studies show that Wi-Fi connectivity is mm-hmm. one of the main features that people look for, even though Bob and I talk all about uh, it's time to disconnect and unhook away from all the devices when the family goes out. But here's another thing. Um, another group of our VRs, that I ran into today, two hours ago, because I'm at this con- this quilters convention with my brother and sister-in-law, as well as my wife, and there were at least a hundred motorhomes parked behind the convention center, mm-hmm. and these are owned by people that that travel the quilting circuit and exhibit at these shows. Now, there are dog show people that have their RVs retrofitted that they can fit the dogs in it sometimes and you know, four or five different dogs, but that's a whole different um, group of travelers, people that are business travelers that um, are away from home for four or five months at a time. Have you run into into crowds like that at all? Because um, tomorrow I'm going to do some interviews with those people. Well, you know, the people, our audience, they're very avid. And we did a survey once and we said in, in, in terms of the, where, I said, where does RVing lie in terms of uh, your uh, hobbies, you know, what, what priority? And they, uh, most of them said it was their number one hobby. That, they lived and breathed it. The quilters, um, they use it to go to their quilting shows. The dog people go to the dog shows. Uh, motocross families, people that right. uh, use yeah. it for sports. They That's where they live. It's convenient. That's why there's so many contract workers today that, you know, can live and bring their families rather than getting an apartment in a town for six months. It makes perfect sense. Yep. RVs okay. are so comfortable. And uh, so, yeah, those you see those all the time. They'll come in. They'll take over a campground. So, you you know, you kind of got to plan ahead to even if it's off season. That's um, exactly this. This is the place that I'm in. I'm, I'm 10 miles out because the ones that are right closest to the city fill up and yeah. they, they jack the prices up. Just like small towns that host a NASCAR race, the prices go up during that show yeah. time. And, uh, um, I'm going to tell you clear. what I'm going to give you one fast sure. example of what's going on in the public sector. If you go to the Yosemite website and you go to camping, it will say that once a month they open up all reservations that are available, I think, for the rest of the season. And they say you need to be there making your reservation before 7 a.m. And at 7 a.m. exactly, you must push the button to send your information because all those campsites for the rest of that season are going to be taken within minutes, if not seconds. So good wow. luck getting into Yosemite. And now there are bots. People have bots set up that will go in every 15 seconds and try to get a reservation. So you've got computers that are trying to get the reservation ahead of, of your efforts. And I'm not sure what those bots, what those people do with them, but it's Zion National Park. Any of the popular parks in the West at least are, um, 
just you're going to have to plan a year ahead to get into the park. It's just a lot of people, you know. The population has doubled in you know 20, 25 years or something. Well, exactly. This town right where we're right now, that's, this town yeah, that's right now, the population has doubled this week. What's yeah. that? And, then, and that's what Jerry was referring to. He's saying down in Florida, you got to make oh. them a year a year in advance. I mean, that's crazy. It, it so you know I didn't I would have loved to go to Florida this year but I won't go down there I I'm not going to plan my trip out you know I want to be able to get I used to say when I did interviews with the media years ago when I got a lot of publicity because I was so unusual with my on the road newspaper back then I used, they'd say what do you what's the biggest decision do you make every day and I said well when I get up I I have to decide if I'm going to turn left or turn right when I leave the campground and um, I could go anywhere, and at four o'clock, I'd look for a campground or an RV park, and there would be no problem. But now you just cannot do that. It's really difficult to find a place. And you know, I got letters the other day. There've been bad winds here. I got letters from people who said we had reservations up, you know, where you are, but we can't drive for the. We've been sitting here for three days because we can't drive in these, you know, forty mile an hour winds. So what happens to the reservations? I mean, it's, you know, it's not the go where you want, when you want um, thing is so hard anymore. And the RVA has got to just stop talking about that. It's not what it is. Did we lose you know? Chuck? Yeah. Uh, nope. He's there. Chuck's there. Okay. Chuck, when you, uh, <clears throat> Chuck, you and I have talked before about why somebody in this country, I mean, you know, I suppose if you and I were 30, 40 years younger, maybe we'd do it. But, we really do need something like a, a holiday inn on the, on the side of the road, you know, yeah. some place that's clean, you know, it doesn't have to be elaborate, maybe no pools or anything else, but do you ever talk to real estate people or do they ever, do they find you because of your notoriety in the industry? Do they ever call you up and say, you know, I, I read your column, Chuck, and I, I, I want to get involved. How do I, uh, how do I get into this campground type business? It's going to take up somebody with a lot of vision that's going to recognize that. You know, I mean, if uh, anybody that's going through Ohio, if you go on the turnpikes there, I'm not sure if it's all of them, but um, they do have some uh, pullouts at rest areas where you can go in and put a credit card into a machine and then you can stay overnight and it'll turn on your 50 amp hookups and, you know, put on your air conditioner for the night, whatever. And then I, th I don't know if you can stay one or two nights. There needs to be something like that. Walmart will pull the plug someday. And that's going to put a lot of people out on the street. Yep. yep. I'm, get, I'm getting feedback. Oh. Yeah. I'm, get, I'm not sure where the feedback is because we've been on there for a while. Um, not sure if this speaker's on or, or whatever. Um, Michelle says we tend to stay at KOAs, but really base it on internet reviews. That is there yeah. again, it's the number one priority, and have found many nice places. Only once in a KOA were we too close to our neighbor. Again, we don't travel. I know, Chuck, you've been too close to your neighbors a few times. Um, let's talk on, on, on the more positive. Oh, Walter joined us. Hi, Walter. We, we stay in Ohio rest area every time we go to Indiana. Yeah, those, those Rhode Island are good. And Jerry says he likes the uh, flying jays and the pilots for his overnight visits versus the uh, the Walmarts and get uh, actually Cracker Barrel too. You, you don't get gas at Cracker Barrel. You get Cabela's and you got uh, the Bass Pro Shop on that. But of the places that you've traveled, Chuck, and, and how many years have you been on the road now? Because I know you did it when you were a young guy well, doing your on the road newsletter. Yeah. How many? Thirty four well, years. Been, I've been doing it two years full time since we you know sold my condo, but. I've been traveling about a quarter to a third of the year for three decades. Yeah. So, I, I notice every once in a while, every once in a while you and Gail will post uh, some, a picture of something strange that you've seen along the yeah. roadways someplace. What, that's kind of like a, a little thing that you guys tend to look for. What, what's the strangest thing that you found that, uh, when you were out there? Well, I'll just tell you what I found um, this in Wichita Falls. It's a funny story. They have what's called the world's littlest skyscraper here. And basically this, uh, there was an oil boom in the area. A, 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 a developer decided he was going to build a skyscraper, but he, he collected $200,000 from investors and he built it. But what he didn't tell the investors, what he kind of hid from them, that the, they approved the plans. But the plans were the skyscraper was going to be in inches instead of feet. So these people thought they were getting a, a 480 foot tall um skyscraper instead it was 48 feet tall or i guess 40 whatever 
and uh, 120 square feet per floor. And of course, by the time they figured it out, this guy had skipped town never to be found again with most of his money. Um, but you can go in there today and there was no, I mean, there was nothing in the skyscraper. There was no, uh, not even stairs to go from one floor to the other, but the town has made fun of it. And I wrote my essay and um, this week in rvtravel.com. If anybody goes there in the newsletter, it's my essay this week was about this. Um, so that's what I look for. I look for that offbeat fun stuff, a uh, little historical trivia. Um, hey Chuck, mm -hmm. before we go further, um, why don't you tell any of our viewers that are watching in, you know, we, we get thousands more people that watch us on replay than yeah. we do live, but um, tell them the place that they can go to access RV travel and also how they can subscribe because well, um, I know real easy, can... real easy. They can go to rvtravel.com and read any of the newsletters. They're right on the front page and uh, they'll find a subscribe. Uh, they'll get a little, uh, prompt when they go on the site the first time it says, do you want to subscribe? But otherwise they just go to rvtravel.com forward slash subscribe and just sign up. It's uh, no spam, easy to unsubscribe. Okay. And it's all uh, 56,000 people on the list always, right now. All we do on Saturday morning. Yeah. Yeah. Every you Saturday also, morning. besides the, the newsletter, the newsletter itself, uh, it's complex behind the scenes because you're, you're linking to a lot of other pages on the website. It might be a particular story. It might be a video. Uh, mm -hmm. It might be another, or it might be a survey. And, and I love the surveys that you do because it kind of gives us a good cross section of your audience. Certainly. Uh, is there one or two particular surveys that kind of stick out that may have come up with different results than what you thought were going to be when you, when you launched it? You know, we're doing a lot right today. Mike Sokol, um, uh, who is amazing, um, and he did one recently when we talked about hot skin conditions, where which is a condition where you can get shocked by your RV. Uh, it's not generally the RV's fault. It's usually the pedestal is set up wrong at the campground or there's some other program. And once in a while, somebody's killed doing this. And we found, I think, that uh, almost 10% of our viewers had at one time or another felt a tingle when they touched their RV. And... And uh, that's a dangerous condition. Uh, basically, if you feel that tingle, then um, there's a problem and maybe not. It's not the pedestal's not ground, wires are reversed, whatever. And if you put one foot on a, like a wet surface like grass where your RV is and the other one touches the metal step, you can be electrocuted and killed instantly. And it happens. So I think um, that survey kind of opened our eyes that we need to get out and educate the public because uh, we had one story a few years ago about a little four-year-old boy who was killed that way. And we've had many letters from readers saying, thank us for, um, uh, uh, you know, for alerting them to this. It's not known and the RV industry won't talk about it because the association is bad and they don't like to talk about that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, we, we, we ask our readers, you know, where they live, how old they are, what kind of RV they have, um, service issues, you know, health insurance, whatever, anything goes. We've asked, Oh, at least I bet a thousand surveys since we started doing them years ago. Um, we know everything about our viewers, their age, their where mm -hmm. they live, where they travel, how they travel. Um, you know, sometimes they're just for fun. I, um, um, we asked people yesterday, we just asked them, do you wear a wristwatch? You know, just a little silly little question. And 35 percent of our people don't wear wristwatches. So Only no, nothing in there except entertainment value. So, um, you know what, Chuck? I I think yeah. there's some demographics involved with that because most – it's interesting, um, uh, the um, – what's it called? The Apple company, you know, people get their smartphones, and then they they don't use a um, – because everybody carries a phone with them. They don't use a wristwatch anymore. Mm -hmm. But interestingly now then – so Apple put the wristwatch companies out of business, and then they come out with an Apple watch. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it seems to be that, um, you know, there's uh, – the people that wear watches, the demographics that would be very interesting because I think you get people like 70 and up that wear one because they yeah. still have the, they have the, the tan on their left yeah. hand. And now you got the 20 somethings that are using them. But there, I think there's a whole generation in between that, you know, gets their clock from this thing like they get everything else. Um, yeah, it's uh, um, in our crowd is older. It's, you know, 55 plus. Um, I can't write to millennials. I don't understand them. I mean, I, you know, I started when I was their age. I know what it's like to be the kid in the campground, but I, I can't speak to them effectively. So uh, 
we, we just appeal to an older audience and heavens knows there's millions and millions and millions of people out there that, that uh, want to RV or are already RVing that we don't even know about us yet. So Chuck, let, let me mention something that uh, I experienced last Saturday and get your reaction to it. And Bob and I had already discussed this, but I was at Bristol Motor Speedway, which mm -hmm. used to hold, well, put it this way. There was a 20 year wait for tickets at that track wow. down in Tennessee. It holds 162,000 people. Okay, mm -hmm. I went on Saturday when they have the minor leagues, you know, the up and comers. Oh yeah. And, um, I said to my wife, when we were out in the area where they were selling all the souvenirs and they had the bar and the karaoke machines, I said, wow, this is an amazing number of young people that are here at this particular event. I didn't yep. really think that much of it. And then when we went in the race, the young people weren't there. So no. I talked to happen to be run into one of the marketing directors at Bristol on the way out. And um, one of the guys had a social media director shirt on. So mm -hmm. I said, obviously, you're trying to reach the young people. He said, they come to the party, but they do in RVs. Yeah. But yet they don't go to the event. Um, how, how mm -hmm. would you describe that? phenomenon well i think that's pretty interesting and you know i mean it sounds like a lot of fun if i was young i'd love to do that i mean mm. we kind of did the same thing in different ways um i know our audience we asked how many had been to a nascar race and it was two percent so we don't have a, a nascar audience you know our audience like i said they they like to go out and soft adventure they like to go to museums and they like to go out to eat and but they're our audience is by and large living in their rvs or they want to um, and so, you know, I don't think they're really camping. I, I've got a question going out and I think with the next couple of weeks, how many campfires do you make in an average month? And I'll bet you it's going to be one or two at the most. Most of them are, they're not making campfires and roasting hot dogs and whatnot. They do on occasion, but that's not what they do. They live in these things. So, yeah. um, and it's so easy to do any, you know, these days. Yeah. You know, there was, uh, I saw something on one of the forums this week and, Somebody raised the question is, are we at a point in time where we need a, a no campfire section in the yeah. campground? Because some of them, some of them you'd think you're at a, a July 4th bonfire. And yeah, we like them and yeah, they're nice and we like them for the s'mores. Uh, but where I'm at up in uh, Old Orchard Beach, you cannot have campfires at your lot, even though you've got the park model and what have you. We have a central uh, campfire up by the pool area and yeah. go up there and have a campfire there or they'll, certain nights of the week they'll have s'mores and some yeah. entertainment or something up there, but they're not allowed on every site because you might get next to that person that is having an issue. Yeah. Hey, Bob and Chuck, let's look at it also from a safety point of view. I think Michelle mentioned earlier on her way back, there was one campground she stayed at, may have, may have been in Texas or, or Arizona, that she said when she put her slide out and the people next to them put their slide out, I mean, they could virtually – you know, hear each other snoring. Um, yeah. So you've got also a safety issue where if there's going to be a fire ring there um, and some sparks, um, you know, uh, you know what I mean? Those amber, ambers, yeah. embers yeah. come up. Um, you've got an issue where you're going to burn down a whole damn, a whole campground at once. Like up in Maine, Bob, a few years ago when, when the train ignited something in like 10, can 10 RVs were burnt to the burnt to a crisp. Yep. Um, really another factor. I think this is yep. where the I think this is the I think this is where there's a problem in terminology is it, that everybody thinks I know how about you guys, but I know when I was little and my parents went out in their little 15 foot travel trailer, we made a campfire. But we were out in national parks, national forests. We weren't, you know, 10 feet from our neighbor. And I think and KOA is really big on having campfires. But I'm telling you, I have been in KOAs and other parks that were worse than the LA smog I remember growing up. Mm -hmm. And there right. people with allergies, we did a survey just within the last couple of months. Bob, you probably got this from us. And 60% of our readers believe there should be no campfire zones, just as there are no smoking zones in restaurants. Mm -hmm. you, you, and probably I've was. had them where they were literally within 10 feet of my bedroom window and the smoke will come in and you must close your window, put on your air conditioning, um, you know, I mean, sure, you could go out and say something to them, but it it happens so often. It's it's a losing battle, and uh, so put them in an area where they can all have their campfires. 
But if as long as you've got your campsite stacked one next to another to get a bunch in, you can you should not be putting a campfire in because people actually do uh, have are al allergic to it, and people actually and it, it can't fire smoke is in fact harmful to you. And I know we've had our eyes burning and. And, you know, and there's no other park to go to. People say, oh, just go to another park down the road. Well, good luck. They're all booked in the summer. So that's a problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was just in Nashville a couple of days ago. Actually, today I left Nashville this morning. And the uh, proximity from one unit to another was absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. And just across the way, there was another campground that caters to kids. I won't go into the names, but... They had some 45 foot Prevost conversions there that when they packed them in backing, you know, one behind another, there was no more than two feet before these units were, were packing in. And the other issue you've got to deal with is generator issues where yeah. people are running generators and nobody has those up pipes. And, yeah. you know, my wife always concerns herself with how we park our unit is the exhaust from the adjacent unit on our side or on the other side? Would you address that, Chuck? Because uh, that will that sets off alarms as well. Yeah, that that happened. I think it was a few years ago, wasn't it, at a NASCAR race where they had them all packed in together? And um, the the uh, I, I think it was as I recall, it was like four people were in the RV. You know, I'm, I'm just going to guess, take a wild guess here, and say they were probably having a few beers or something. They fell asleep, <laughs> but the exhaust was literally coming right in the window, and it killed them. And so right. uh, you've got to be careful that, yeah. where you park. You know, you can't leave your kid in the back bedroom, have the neighbor's exhaust pipe coming right into their windows. This is not good. And uh, in close proximity, you do have to be aware of what, you know, of your neighbors, what they're doing. Um, and, of course, beginning RVers there are not very educated, and uh, they really don't know all these things. So it's part of our mission to try to get to these people, too, to uh, educate them. Yep, and uh, going back to your your strange uh, places, Jerry says, "Have you seen? Have you been to Arkansas, Chuck, to see the largest magnolia?" Is that no, it? I was just in Arkansas a few months ago, but I missed that. Where is it, um, Jerry? Where is the largest mag? I assume that's a magnolia tree that uh, you're talking about, Jerry. Where where might you uh, be hiding that one? Um, well, I try to see the largest things wherever they are or the smallest. Um, hey, Bob and, well, yeah. Bob and Chuck, I huh? saw that uh, Alan Warren was on with us a little earlier. I don't know if he's still on, but Alan's got a very interesting scenario because he is a media guy just like all of us, but he also owns a campground, and he yeah. also owns one in Texas. Yeah. And um, if Alan is still on and you want to just uh, let us know that, Alan, we can ask you some specific questions from a campground owner's perspective as to, uh, you know, what are your pet peeves that campers are expecting from you? Or what are some of the crazy things that campers do um, all on the, under their 45 to $50 a night? Um, and I know Alan's got a big show tonight and he always follows us after, uh, yeah. after we yeah, get Chuck off. Was, on. Chuck was on with him. Uh, Chuck was on with him last month. That's the RV yep. show USA that comes on at eight o'clock yep. on the yep. RV say uh, Facebook. Now, do you know what his topic is tonight, John? I don't. He's yeah. got um, he's got Marianne Edwards on first half hour. She's uh, has a, a uh, uh, organization called Boondockers Boondockers Welcome, where uh, people uh, uh, kind of sign up to have people come stay at their places and they host them. And it's pretty neat. It's a pretty neat deal. Um, she's on the first half hour. Yeah, you know, Alan was is in San Antonio, and that's basically where I stayed. So we got together several times while I was there. Good guy. Right at his yeah. foot, at Big yeah, Chief. Yeah, that's, that, that yeah. sounds like uh, Harvest Host or a couple of those other yeah, ones. Yeah, like that, yeah. I, I think his second hour, he's talking about uh, clothing optional campgrounds. Hmm. I saw a post, yeah. clothing optional I, campgrounds. I, I just hope he has no photos because um, – <laughs> No, Chuck, look out your window right now. No, no, no. Look I out your window that. right now. No, no. no and that's imagine your neighbors without no. their champion sweatshirts on. No, I think they got to have as many clothes on as possible in a lot of these places. I, I don't want to. No, that's that's, that's not my. That's I'm not bad. going there. Yeah. That's no, no, no. No. Yeah. Hey, John, I was brought that up at the end of the show. Uh, Talk about large, large things that are out there. Don't we have the um, 
largest Paul Bunyan statue up in Maine. Oh, I'm Bangor. Yeah, yeah. So, so we got to get you. Got to get you to come up to the. You're going to come up to the northeast. You're going to come up this summer. You're going to try to come yeah. up here and visit. Yeah, we'll summer. come up. Wait, yeah. I think there's yeah. a lot of large Paul Bunyans. They're probably fighting over that one, but uh, oh, okay. um, big one in uh, uh, Northern California, the Redwoods that talks to you. You go, the kids go up and it talks to you. So uh, it's yeah. pretty funny. Um, okay. And we should tell, tell our viewers uh, when Chuck is up here, we talked about this last month. When Chuck is up here, I'm going to put together a, uh, a little bit of a forum and invite our state campground association people and maybe get uh our good Sam people in there for kind of a general discussion about the RV industry today, the campground situation, because it's not something that you can put your head in the sand with. If we're going to sell a half million units a year, we got to figure out where we're going to put all these people. So uh, on your journey, as you head north, where, where do you go after you're doing Witcher for Top Falls? You got a schedule that I know we're going to meet up again in uh, Hershey at the Hershey show, but yeah. where do you go between now and then? That's that's always a great time. Always look forward to seeing you guys, John. You better get there this year. Um, we're going to go up to um, we're going to Elkhart May seventeenth to twenty first because uh, our village, which is ourvillage dot com, is having oh, yeah. a rally there. I think they're going to have five hundred people. And actually, I'll be speaking. Uh, I'm going to talk. My topic is thirty years on the RV road, something like that. It's um, pretty fun. I've done that. You know, kind of the changes, and it's mostly it's pretty light. Um, a lot of funny stuff that I found. Um, and then um, stop you for a second. Yes. While you go up there, you should go a day or two early because uh, the power breakfast is there that particular week. And I, I know they'd love to have you there. I don't know about that. They might, be, <laughs> they might shoot me. They, they, Chuck, they may be looking for a keynote speaker. Yeah, you know? yeah, not me. I don't think they want me anywhere near them. Six, don't, six, don't let six, anybody seven. know you're near Elkhart. No, I got to go incognito. I got to put on a disguise. I'm afraid they're going to come after me, all the things I'm saying. but, but wear, uh, a Greg, wear a Greg Gerber mask. Yeah, yeah. No, then I'll even be a bigger target. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll have to dye your, dye your hair and, and wear dark sunglasses, Chuck. Yeah, right. yeah. I gotta, yeah. <laughs> of course, I did. I, I, I'll, go, I'll just go back to my natural color. I, I dyed it great so I'd look more mature, so. Uh, well, yeah. hey, hey guys, I think it's very safe to say that we all love RVing, oh, but yeah. at the same time, there's so much potential for being better, whether it be the manufacturers, yeah. whether it be the dealer relationships, whether it be the campgrounds and the relationship with the campers. Um, why can't we all just get along and, <laughs> and make this as great uh, you know, a great, it's really a worldwide tradition. It's not just American. I mean, the most yeah. of them are made in the U S but what's to prevent us from all having a, um, you know, uh, listening to each other and making this whole deal better. Yeah. That's just a lot of people, a lot of interests, a lot of polite people, a lot of impolite people. Um, you know, it's, it's a nice thought, but, uh, just a lot of people out there and a lot of people that don't really understand the culture, I will tell you this little tip for everybody is that if you want to really have a great adventure in RVing, go to Iceland and rent an RV and take the ring road around the country. The Iceland people are nuts about RVing and they, um, it is the most beautiful country. Don't go there in the winter. There's no light, but go in the summer and uh, it's magnificent. Did it a few years ago. Anyway, just a little tip, little tip for you there. There you go. Head up to Iceland. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. We exceeded our half hour again we're coming up on uh, 45 minutes so we should probably close it out a little bit uh any any closing thought let, let me put your uh, website up there again chuck so that they have it um and where were you going to be between here and uh hershey where were you, you were yeah we'll be, in, we'll be in elkhart i don't know where we'll be other than that you know we're just the We'll start looking around for reservations and find something. You know, it's pretty easy this time of year, but once Memorial Day hits, it's 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 not going to be easy after that. We're going to be up in Wisconsin for two months this summer. Found a spot up there. It's very quiet, and uh, we won't have for two months. We won't have to worry about reservations. We were going to go back to Seattle, uh, but the park we were in, Seattle, they can't. Even, we were there for two you know two different times. They can't even take, get us back in. They're booked. So I mean, there's nothing, and that's just the way it's going. So. Uh, who knows where we'll go? We'll go where there's a nice place. And I don't know. Every place has got interesting things to see and do. I don't care where I go. 
um, it's always fun to explore. And um, but uh, Wisconsin for part of the summer, and then um, and we'll see you guys in Hershey, and that's always a great time. Chuck, Love is it. your daughter, is your daughter Emily still a East Coast correspondent? No, Emily moved to Seattle, and she's working with me, and she's doing great. And she's just thriving. And, you know, she's, uh, yeah, she got tired of the big city and uh, she's back there and she's working from home and she's a really important part of our operation and she's having a great time. So yeah, you broke down at the beginning. Wonderful. She's back home in Seattle, right, Chuck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She's just loving it. And she, you know, she's been RVing since she was two weeks old. So she loves it. She, she, and we've done so many road trips together when she was in high school and she'd come with me for two or three weeks. She, she knows the, she knows the, she knows the lifestyle. And yeah. I guess Walter, Walter, uh, Walter Swenson's with us, and he's got a he's got a long comment, but I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to show it, but I'm not sure if it's going to show everything. He says he has got his business model for an, uh, let me read it. it. He's got a business model for an RV roadside stop. So that's what we're talking about. These little areas that will get people that can handle them as they travel around the country. Maximum yeah. stay three nights. Sites are all pulled through, seventy five feet long. Sites are level to quarter bubble on paved compacted pad, sites are 50 feet apart. RV repair parts service on site. I got a story coming up on that one. I just did a story on a campground with the full service thing. Store with grocery supplies, pools where possible, playgrounds, and a dog walk park. Okay, that's more than just the, the roadside uh, service. Sounds like uh, a campground to me. Yeah, yeah, I don't think that's gonna fly. It's, uh, you know, you figure, Fifteen to twenty-five thousand dollars to build a camp, an RV park. That's that's per spot, and that doesn't include the land. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm my idea is something like a Walmart, glorified Walmart lot where it's uh, where it's official, where sites are designated, kind of like the Ohio Turnpikes, which is a great idea. Put your money, credit card, in a machine. It turns on your fifty amps or thirty amps, and uh, then move on the next day because Walmart yeah. is going to pull the plug. The homeless are starting to find Walmart, and they're moving in, and and Walmart won't put up with that. So I think people are going to – where are you going to go? Where are these people going to go overnight? Um, Walmart's become America's campground, and it's, that's not what it intended. That's not what Sam Walton intended, and it's not what most RVers um, bought into. But it's complicated. It's very complicated, and I will just say that that's something we're dealing with every week, every day trying to make sense of all this and make make it better for our viewers and so i'm doing what i can behind the scenes and uh, i think we're making some progress but you know it's hard to fight the uh, all the forces that are you know fighting lemon laws fighting all the things that our viewers really need to have yep yeah yep. It's, so about, it's, been, yeah. it's been great having you we could probably do it a lot more often but uh, we'll be seeing you along the road say hello to gail and uh I guess the next time we see you will be, well, will we see you in Maine before Hershey? Or are you going to try to get up to Maine? Um, I th after? think it might. I'd say yes, it probably will be before Hershey. So okay. I'll, I'll keep you posted. Yeah, we'll come up into Massachusetts. And, um, yeah, I don't know. We were, you know, went up there two years ago. It's been some time. But, we'll, yeah, we'll see you guys, hope, hopefully. So you can, I'll buy you your for your first Jack Daniels. All right. So, That's good yeah. enough. John, I'll buy That's you good. whatever you got. What, what? First Jack Daniels. You notice he said first Jack Daniels. <laughs> yeah, you just <laughs> camera out of my face. Of, okay. Yeah. There's usually a, usually oh, yeah. a second. Right. Uh, yeah. right. I've, got, uh, I've got two closing Thanks. announcements on our contest. So I'm going to drop you down, Chuck. So, uh, okay. again, John, any last words for Chuck before I drop uh, him off the broadcast? Well, no, for Chuck, although Chuck's site would do this as well. But I had a circ and if you go to RV Travel on the Facebook page, I know many times people ask questions and other RVers answer them. But I had a circumstance on Friday or Saturday where um, my generator started, but it wasn't giving juice to the either refrigerator or the microwave. That's how I knew that I had an issue because I was trying to warm up something in the microwave. So I posted something on, well, I'll tell you, it was living the RV dream because there's 50,000 yeah. people there. And we know the Huggins anyway. And um, within 10 seconds, I, I posted that issue. I said, I've got a problem here. The generator starts, but it's not providing juice. And within 10 seconds, two people had told me what to do. I went down, pressed a pressed the circuit breaker on my generator, and it was fine. And I know Chuck's site, you've got thousands of people as well to do that. And that's one of the great things about our VRs is that they're always willing 
to help a fellow RVer. Oh, no, it's great. I mean, it's great. And I still love it. You know, I talk a lot about the bad stuff, but I, I still love it. I'm having the time of my life out here. Gail and I are just just having a great time. And and uh, it's just so much fun. It's just more challenging. And you know what? That just comes with uh, twice as many people in the same places. It's just that's yep. the way it is. And uh, Back up. I don't know what but, you can do about it. it just I, go I wouldn't wouldn't trade it for anything. We'll do no. it right. I love it. The end. Yeah, they, uh, you got you got comments about the contest. Yeah, I got a con- All right, Chuck, I'm gonna drop you off. You got to bring up some graphics. But okay, thank I'm you. I'm just very- gonna go away here. Then I'm I'm gonna leave. Okay. All right, sir. Thank you for mm-hmm. having. Yep. Okay, so I wanted to bring up. As I said, we had some. Let me see if I do this. Uh, that's not what I want. Boom. Cool. I'm playing around with everything here. I really wanted to get that fast. Yeah, let's try it that way. Um, we have we're finishing up this week the contest for the WineGuard uh, WineGuard Connect 2.0 Wi-Fi booster. We will have that. That contest runs through Friday on our website. You'll see it down there. We've had a lot of interest this week on that. And at Friday, I think at five o'clock, we're going to draw the winner for that. Next week. And we'll be announcing a full slate of products, but Equalizer and Fastway have donated five products, and we're going to donate every day. We got some smaller products, like some new hitch pins and some chalk uh, restrainers. But the, one of the top prizes, which we'll probably give away next Friday, will be an Equalizer hitch, made in America, seventy percent U.S. made steel, life, almost a lifetime warranty. It's it's just a great product. And we'll be giving that out also. So stay tuned on our contest throughout the uh, the month of April. So that is that, and I think we can wrap it up, John. Any any where do you go from uh, Kentucky, or when no, do you head home? Kentucky, we're uh, stopping in Louisville on the way back. We're in Paducah. We're on the western Kentucky. We're stopping in Louisville, seeing seeing some of our Kenny Rogers guys. And uh, I think you stopped at Gene Roy's house uh, yes, when we were did. coming yeah. through last time. And uh, then we're heading back and. Uh, Back to normal, if there's such a thing as normal, next week with uh, babysitting six grandchildren. Oh, I should say, <laughs> we did have a brand new grandchild. So uh, I may have mentioned that last week, but we're pretty excited. That's number six, three boys, three girls. There you go. Half a dozen. All right. Okay. Uh, wow, we almost hit hit an hour this week. Uh, again, right. thank you very much for joining. Uh, don't forget to hit the, bottom, the share button on the bottom. Send the right. links to your friends. And- they can tune in afterwards and see it. Uh, Tom Very Zabrowski, good night, Tom. We'll get to you soon. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, Michelle wants to meet Chuck. Okay. All right. We'll, well, when he comes up. All right. Good night. We'll see you good next everybody. week. Bye.